Buenas tardes, buenos días, buenas noches, depende de dónde nos estén viendo en este momento, desde eh, el set de CAF, aquí en la COP28. Este es el pabellón de América Latina y el Caribe, impulsado por el Banco de Desarrollo de América Latina y el Caribe. Y tenemos el honor de estar acompañados por Peter Thompson, el enviado especial de las Naciones Unidas para los Océanos. Uh, great to have you here, uh, Ambassador Thompson. It's uh, really an honor for us to be uh, accompanied by you. And I'll start asking you, uh, what, do you what are your expectations for this COP28 regarding the oceans? Uh, I'd, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to make a point because it's a political point for me. Okay. Los Oceanos. It should be singular. It should be one. Yeah, uh, and I, th I make that point because I want your viewers to appreciate the fact, because it's very important. There is only one ocean. If we take away all the names that human beings have put on the maps, and you look at the map with no names on it, you see there's only one ocean. Why is it important for us to understand that? Because it's like one big bathtub. If you turn on the tap at one end, it's going to go up at the other end as well. So a melting Greenland ice sheet in the north, up in the Arctic, is going to affect the sea level rise in the uh, South Pacific, like somewhere like Tuvalu or Kiribati, these countries that are just flat atoll republics. So it's very important that we understand that it's just one ocean. And uh, that's why, for example, my, my role is the, under, the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for the Ocean, One Ocean. One Ocean. So I, I don't want to be rude, but it's part of my job of ocean literacy to really make that point strongly, uh, because you know, we're all connected. Yes, all these bodies of water connected, species that travel between all these areas. That's it. Uh, and most of it has not been studied yet. You're quite right, you're quite right. Uh, it's estimated, obviously it's an estimation, that we only know about 20% of the uh, scientific information about the ocean. That's incredible when you think that 95% of uh, life on the planet is contained in the ocean. It's quite incredible that we only know 20% about it. Now, the, I was in China a couple of weeks ago meeting a group of scientists there and I learned something there from the scientists which uh, really blew my mind which is that of the biomass in the ocean, 95%, you know, you might think it's fish or whales, no, 95% of the biomass of the ocean is in fact microbial. Okay. So uh, why is that significant? Because, you know, microbial means things like viruses and bacteria and phytoplankton, zooplankton. Uh, and so Things what, that our eyes are not able to, we, to and catch. which we are not taught about yes. in school. This is what why I'm, yeah. you know, sorry to be pedantic in the interview, but this is why I push these points because people need to understand it because we're not taught about it in school. So the whole thing about ocean literacy is uh, for people to understand what's going on, actually going on in the ocean, and it's not just surfing or sailing or whales or it's microbial, right? And that if. And life on this planet is not possible without that microbial life in the ocean. Mm -hmm. We are taught about lions and zebras and pandas in school. Why? Because we're mammals, we can relate to them, look at them, etc. But our existence doesn't depend on them. Our existence depends on the microbial life in the ocean. For example, the, the tiniest uh, photosynthetic organism in the ocean is called Prochlorococcus. And everybody should know about this. All the school children should know about Prochlorococcus. Why? It produces 20% of the oxygen in the biosphere. Yeah. Yet m most people never heard of it. They know about lions and I've tigers. Heard of it. <laughs> this is because we weren't taught it at school. Huh? Yeah. I certainly was not. In my school in Fiji, we didn't learn ocean science, which we should be teaching our kids. That's my point about ocean literacy. And it has to be based on science. So the good news is that ocean science is receiving more attention now than any point in human history before. Ocean science is really getting the attention now. But so, is ocean research receiving enough attention and funding? Uh, funding could be a lot better. and We need a massive pivot 
towards uh, ocean science and towards a sustainable blue economy. Why? Because that is the, the future security of, and I've just given an example with Prochlorococcus, the future security is understanding the, the ocean science, uh, which then leads on to you know health issues, which leads on to food security issues, uh, leads on to energy issues, and so on. So, um, yeah, it's just fundamental stuff, really. So, um, you say micro uh, life, microorganisms make up 80% of, of the biomass, but also microplastics are now one of the major threats to ocean life. Mm -hmm. um, most of these threats to the oceans come from land, from human activity on land, yeah. not only on the seas. What is your message to the people? Also, land landlocked country uh, habitats that maybe are not aware of their actions toward the oceans. Yeah, well landlocked countries of course rely on the oceans as much as coastal countries do in terms of nutrition, in terms of uh, the oxygen they breathe and so on. Uh, because you know 50% of the oxygen on the planet comes from uh, the ocean. But um, yeah, you know what's the message is uh, that we have to respect the ocean. Uh, it's not a matter of um, thinking that it's going to be unchanged forever. No, it's, it's changing and it's changing fast. It's more acidic very quickly, uh, losing oxygen, uh, warming up, global warming, and of course that means rising sea level, death of coral, etc. You have to understand all those things. Um, I was very pleased to hear actually today that the OAS, the Organization of American States, is doing a lot of work on uh, source to sea. So source to sea is like an ethos uh, of understanding that everything we do on land ends up in the ocean, right? So from the ridge right to the reef. Uh, if you put in some uh, chemical up here uh, at the, near the, the, the ridge of the mountain, it's going to make its way down this chemical into the sea. That's the source to sea ethos. And, and the ethos is about stopping the pollution coming down, whether it's chemical or excess fertilizers or you mentioned microplastics or plastics uh, generally. Uh, so we on land are the source of the pollution and uh, we cannot take the ocean's health for granted. In fact, the ocean's health is declining. We have to stop that decline because we can't have a healthy planet without a healthy ocean. If we don't have a healthy planet, you can kiss us, <laughs> us goodbye as well, right? Yeah. So that's why the source to sea ethos is so important. Uh, and I think, you know, looking at your region, uh, my uh, suspicion is that the Sargossum plague, I call it that because I've been in the Caribbean to experience what it can do, that Sargossum, when it comes in, uh, in, in force. Uh, you know, it can close down resorts, uh, the one I was staying in, closed down. Uh, and um, uh, my suspicion is that that is a source to sea issue, that it's uh, all about excess nutrients coming down the Orinoco. And agricultural the activities, probably. Yeah, probably from excess nutrients. Uh, that the Sargossum Sea is having this explosion of life and it's an example of source to sea. So just a final uh, question, a very quick question. Uh, you are optimistic that we can reverse the situation and the ocean can be uh, what it used to be at some point in, in time? Look, uh, I'm uh, a grandfather, I have four granddaughters, so you know, and this is why I do what I do, uh, is to protect the future uh, for them. Uh, and obviously everybody cares about their little ones, and uh, you know, the bad news at the moment is we're going in the wrong direction. Secretary General of the United Nations, it says we're we're heading towards an unlivable world. Unlivable. What does he mean by that? Uh, three degrees, you know, is a world on fire. And uh, that's not what we're going to consign our grandchildren and our children to. We refuse. We reject that future. But that's where we're currently heading. So we have a lot of work to do. We have to make that turn to 1.5. We have to be courageous about that. And you only have to hold your little ones to find the courage to make the changes. Uh, but uh, that is the calling of our times and uh, you know there's too much greenwashing going on the oil companies uh, made a five trillion dollar profit this year profit yeah. this okay. year and uh, the IEA you know the, uh, the Electric International Electricity Agency energy agency based in uh, Paris 
They put out a report last week saying that the oil and gas industry is only contributing 1% towards the cost of transition to renewable energy. If you see the billboards on the highways, you think they're leading it, but the, no, they're not. Uh, IEA says they're only putting in 1%. So, you know, you can see where the problem is, and, you know, human beings uh, run the oil industry. It's not artificial intelligence or robots. So uh, we need some accountability uh, uh, for what they are doing to our planet and to our children. Ambassador Thompson, thank you so much for your time, and well, you're always welcome here at the CAF STEM at the COP28. Well, thanks for the great work that CAF's doing. Thank you. Yes. Well, muchas gracias por seguirnos aquí desde el pabellón de CAF en la COP28.